Just before we get started, I do want to say that this video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. More about them in just a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, hello there. I'm your host, Simon Wams here, one of my writers today, Arnaldo. Welcome, Arnaldo, has written me a script. This one is called... Literally, this is how new it is to me. I'm reading this for the first time right now. A serial killer in Nazi Germany. The S-Bahn murderer. Arnaldo, thank you so much. On YouTube, in the first 30 seconds, I've managed to mention serial killer and Nazi Germany and murderer. And now I've mentioned them twice each. So there goes all my monetization for the video. I might actually lose money on this job. Cry me a river. Uh, Arnaldo, thank you so much for putting this together. What happens here? I've not read this before. It's brand new to me. We're going to explore this murdering Nazi serial killer. Brilliant. <laughs> Get the feeling this one's going to be a bit depressing, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, afterwards, Jen. Here I am. Is going to edit it. She adds in some images, some memes, some music. We love everyone for it. Let's go. Fourth of December, 1940. Night was about to fall over Berlin. With most men away at the front, women in the city had got used to a new routine, a new way of life in which every night of sleep could be interrupted by the distant rumbling roar of the British bombers, followed by the wail of air raid sirens. A new way of avoiding death in which artificial light was almost completely vanished. Lester provided British crews with a clear target amidst an ocean of shadow. After sunset blackout measures reigned supreme, every window had to be covered in black curtains, every light bulb or headlamp shielded in black shades. But life had to go on. Many young women had to work in government offices, hospitals or factories, traveling alone on the Berlin commuter train, the S-Bahn. Sitting in dimly lit compartments with windows obscured, they hoped for a quiet night of respite from aerial incursions. What they could not imagine was that another menace, less conspicuous but equally lethal, lurked in the shadows of blacked out Berlin, ready to strike. Yeah, and this is uh, kind of like the serial killer in one of these times. It's like when there's loads of stuff going on, so the police and everything and everyone is going to be focused on so much other stuff that I, you've got to, there's got to be so many crimes going on in like war zones that are not even related to war because people are like, mm, I was going to commit this crime. Now's the perfect time to like murder my neighbor. And I'd be like, yeah, no one will ever know because the city's being evacuated. There's bombings. I'll just like throw his body in with a pile. It's like, holy shit. The amount of crimes that must quietly go on during wartime that no one investigates because they're just out of the resources is crazy and depressing. 4th of December 1940, night had fallen over Berlin. On any other night, total darkness would have engulfed the railroad depot at Rammelsburg, eastern Berlin, near the tracks of the S-Bahn. But that night, shadowy figures were chased away by the flashlights held by a group of men, some uniformed, some in plain clothes. Their lights wandered in the night before shining on what they were looking for. The body of a young woman in a nurse uniform, lying motionless on the railway embankment. The coroner, Dr. Weimann, urged caution before jumping to conclusions. It could have been an accident after all. But Detective Inspector Zach of the Criminal Palazzi already feared the worst. Two women had already been viciously assaulted on the s and thrown off the moving train, and left for dead. But they had survived by miracle. But this was different. The mysterious assailant had graduated to murder. And pressure kept on mounting from above. The heads of the Reich Security Office wanted the case solved. But the Minister for Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, wanted the investigation to be hushed up. Inspector Zach and his superior, Captain Ludke, had a tough job ahead of them. Would they ever crack the case of the S-Bahn murderer? If you're a cop, I know we just said like all the men were off at war. If you were a cop during the war, do you have to stay behind? Or do you, I mean, do you have to stay behind? Do you get to stay behind? Or do you go to the front? Because... I can't imagine there were many women policemen back in the day. I'm sure there were some, but not like the majority. I mean, it's the majority today still got, it's still got to be. I kind of feel like cops still a male dominated profession, right? And so do they stay behind to enforce cop stuff? Because there must be people who have to stay behind, like who are critical for this kind of stuff. <laughs> if there was a war, I mean, there is a war, but if war comes to like me, it's like, I'm definitely one of those people. It's like, dude, your job. <laughs> Get in line, conscript. <laughs> it's like, sh a pest among the allotments. 
Blackout regulations were first imposed on Berliners on the 1st of September 1939 to coincide with the German invasion of Poland. From that date, women living around the eastern district of Friedrichsfeld started reporting a series of random assaults taking place under the cover of total darkness in the local garden colony. To clarify, Berlin garden colonies were similar to the public allotments in many British towns, where citizens can rent a small plot of land to grow vegetables or quietly sip a beer in front of their tool shed. Young ladies returning home from work would be startled by an un seen man who jumped from behind one of these tool sheds. The man would normally blind them with his flashlight before hurling sexually laden insults at them. <laughs> Holy shit. With time, the severity of the attacks increased. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this guy escalated to murder? It's like, yeah, yeah, you know, he, he shouts insults at women like a crazy person. And then he's now a murderer. I mean, uh, we should keep an eye on this guy. The sex pest roaming the gardens progressed from insults and threats of violence to actual violence. Eventually, he committed his first rape and more followed. On most occasions, the victims were not able to provide a description of the cowardly fiend, but some of them noticed an important detail. The pest wore the uniform of a railway worker. The mysterious railway man racked up a total of 32 offenses of various degrees of severity. What are you doing? If you're like a criminal and you're committing crimes, are you really going to wear like something so identifiable as a rail... It's like, what... <laughs> Way works for railway, doesn't he? Or we've just narrowed it down from basically in the entire population of a town to only men who work for the railway. And with most men away, it's going to be really narrowed down. The mysterious railway man racked up a total of 32 offences of varying degree of severity. The file for the Friedrichsfeld attack had initially been picked up by the Orpro or Unordsdungs Polisi in charge of lesser crimes. <laughs> Wait. Oh, okay, because he was just shouting at people. It's like, holy shit. Rape is a lesser crime? I know it's Nazi Germany, guys, but shit. Eventually, it was escalated to the Creepro, or criminal polizzi, which dealt with cases of murder, arson, and rape. There we go. The Creepo reported to Reich Security Main Office of the Nazi regime, led by Reinhard Heydrich, affectionately known as the Hangman of Prague, or the architect of the final solution. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Fucking Heydrich. He was murdered in Prague, which was nice. Uh, there's that movie Anthropoid all about it, where he's just taking his car through, and some legend throws a grenade in there, and he doesn't die immediately, but he later does, and it's like, nice. Nice! 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 Heydrich also oversaw even the... Uh, I've made a video about Heydrich, I'm pretty sure. And even the other Nazis were afraid of him. Because the other Nazis were all like, yeah, we know we're the bad guys. And Heydrich was just like, I've been given the job and I will do it. And it's like, holy shit, Heydrich. He just didn't care either way. He was like full psychopath. Just like, no, I don't really... I don't mind the Jews. I don't hate... I, I think it was Heydrich. And he was just like, I don't feel... In, I, I just feel indifferent to them. It's like, yeah, I can kill millions of them. No problem. And it's like, holy shit, my dude. What the fuck? But then he got brutally murdered. Woo! Heydrich oversaw the activities of the Gestapo and the SS. It was common for the Kripo and the Gestapo to cooperate on the prosecution and persecution of enemies of the Reich. Some Kripo officers even joined the ranks of the Einsatzgruppen, murdering Jews, Roma, and other undesirables. But many other Kripo officers were not staunch supporters of the regime and actually made a career by cracking down on Nazi paramilitary groups before their rise to power. We'll meet one of these top detectives later in our story. At this stage, the Kripo could not do anything to track down the garden pest as his Attacks had suddenly stopped. Wait, so at this point, he'd been elevated, he'd, he'd raised his crimes to rape, and they're still calling him a pest. It's like, oh, he's just a bit of a pest. It's like, no, 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 he's a rapist. There's a difference. Shit, guys, come on. Unbeknownst to the investigation, the attacker had committed an almost fatal mistake. As per the playbook of the perfect coward, the railroad had always picked on lone women whose husbands had probably been drafted in the military. But one night he failed to notice that his intended victim was being escorted at a distance by her husband and her husband's brother. When she cried for help, the two men intervened and introduced the sex offender to their personal brand of Blitzkrieg, a barrage of punches and kicks. That night, the railwayman found out that fighting two men was not as easy as surprise attacking a young lady. Who would have known? <laughs> Unfortunately, the Weasley offender might manage to evade capture and beat a hasty retreat into the shadows from whence he had crawled. What the f***? These two guys are beating the f*** out of him? Take it to a police station as well. Come on. A free upgrade. 
The bad encounter convinced the rapist to lay low for several months. It had also taught him a lesson, the wrong one. A notion started forming in his mind. If he wanted to avoid retaliation, he had to silence his victims quickly and violently. He also decided to change hunting grounds as allotments could be frequented by too many witnesses. On the evening of September 20th, 1940, Gerda Cargo was traveling home on a third-class carriage of the S-Bahn. Tired from long day's work, she fell asleep. When she woke up, she had missed her station. She immediately... They used to have third-class... <laughs> They have none of that shit today. I've talked about this before. Trains in the UK are like the worst. Because when I was a kid, there was a first class section and then just like regular section. And the first class section, it was like a different carriage. It was nice. They had these little rooms. They had a person with a cart with like snacks and shit that you had to pay for. Anything off the trolley, dears? No, thanks. I'm all set. But it was nice. I, I never traveled in it, but a friend of mine from school, he was uh, he was Korean. And uh, he'd often, he lived in the UK for years. We went to school together for like seven years. And he'd always just sit in first class. He'd always just sit in first class. And as soon as the inspector came, he'd just start speaking Korean at him. And the inspector, they like, couldn't find him because he'd just be like, I do not understand what's going on. And so the inspector would just show him to the economy section and sit him down. <laughs> Legend. <laughs> But nowadays, it's like, there's no, it, there's hardly any difference. First class is just like, there's four seats at the end of the carriage. And they don't seem to be any different other than the fact they're a different color. At least on like, southeast trains. I don't know. It's kind of a bit of a joke. Fascinating tangent, Simon. Thank you for that. We've all wanted, we come here to learn about trains, don't we? That's exactly, that's exactly what you're all here for. Train chat with Simon. Tired from a long day's work, she fell asleep. When she woke up, she had missed her station. She immediately dismounted. I can't, I've never done that. I know it's more train talk with Simon. But I used to take the train all the time, like to different places, because I lived in the middle of the countryside. And it'd be like, as I became like an adult or like late in my teens, it'd be like, hang out with my mates. And it'd be like, everyone lived like all over the place. So I'd sometimes take a train. It'd be like a 20 minute train, train ride just to go to the pub. And it's like, sometimes I have no idea how I never miss my station. And it's like, if I miss that station, you're on the last train. It's like you're ending up at a place called Ashford International. And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you get, you're in Ashford International and there's no trains home. It's like, well, looks like you're waiting until five in the morning, aren't you, Whistle? But fortunately, never happened. She immediately dismounted and climbed onto a train traveling in the opposite direction. The problem was that her ticket was no longer valid. She was visibly nervous when a railway worker approached her and struck up a conversation. She confessed to not having a valid ticket, but the kindly man offered her a free upgrade. How about she sat with him for the rest of the journey in second class? He would vouch for her in case they encountered a ticket controller. Gerda accepted and the two moved into an empty, dimly lit second-class carriage. After just 11.30 p.m., the sympathetic worker revealed his true colors. Without any warning, he assaulted Gerda, wrapping his hands around her neck. But Gerda fought back. By the time she eventually fell unconscious, it was only three minutes before the train would reach the next stop. The attacker panicked. What if somebody climbed onto the train and found him next to a limp body? The man dragged Gerda's body by the carriage door, flung it open, and tossed the body from the train, traveling at 80 kilometers an hour. Wait, is this the woman that survived? That's incredible. As he did so, an electric wave of pleasure surged through his body. It was a feeling of omnipotence, stronger than any pleasure you could extort from a defenseless woman. As Gerda's body flew across the Berlin night, the rapist realized that he enjoyed killing. But fortunately for Gerda, she did not die that night. By an incredible stroke of luck, the woman landed onto a pile of sand by the railway track, which absorbed the impact of the fall. Oh my god. That is crazy lucky. The morning after, she was taken to the hospital and questioned by the Orpo. Reminder, this is the police division for lesser crimes. Thank you for that, Arnaldo. <laughs> I think Arnaldo listens to these. And he probably is. He's just sympathetic to me because I, so often when there's too many names of different new divisions or foreign names, I'll be like, oh my God, who is that? I've got to go back and check what's going on. Now I get a little reminders from, from my small brain. Thank you. That sounds like a real hero. A shocked Gerta was not able to provide much detail, admitted to having consumed alcohol before traveling on the S-Bahn. The detail convinced the Orpo that Gerta was somehow lying and that her fall was the result of a drunken accident. Her report did not reach the criminal police or Crypo. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> it makes no sense. It's like, yeah, no, I fell off the train and landed in a sand patch. You would just say that. Why would you make up a story? Come on, police. You're as disappointing in Germany, apparently, as everywhere else. The attacker was free to strike again, and soon he would commit his first murder. This is such a serious crime. It's fully attempted murder, and the police are like, nah, you're just lying because you were a drunk woman. <laughs> it's 
Stupid. Now, just before we continue with today's video, I do want to tell you about Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of non fiction and documentary titles for your enjoyment. Their, uh, their copyright here describes it as the Netflix for nerds, the Hulu for history buffs, the Disney Plus for the scientist in us, which uh, is something way cleverer than, uh, than I could come up with. And I love it. Also, oh, they also mentioned the price here already. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you right now then. Curiosity Stream is under twenty dollars a year, which makes it insane. I, I don't know. I feel like my other unnamed streaming service, the one everyone has. I don't know. I pay for the four K version of that, and it's. I swear, it's got to be like that much a month, right? It's. It ain't cheap. Curiosity Stream, same price for the whole year. Just in case you didn't know, there are twelve months in every year. When highlighting Curiosity Stream, talk about a documentary or series that you enjoy. Oh, I'll tell you about one I enjoy. I've got it open right here. It's called Crime Scene Solvers, and you could guess why I picked it for an advert for Curiosity Stream on this channel. It's all about true crime. They look into cases. What is interesting about the show, it's originally French, but it's one of these documentaries where they've remade it so you can't really tell. Like, all the titles are in English, all of the narration and stuff's in English. It's really well done. Uh, but what is nice about that is it's a bunch of cases that you probably don't know, because they're like French. And they're all like super mysteriously like, I don't know how this one ends. I have no idea. But France, uh, <laughs> at least from me watching True Crime Solvers, it seems to be an absolute hotbed of weird crime. So, uh, Crime Scene Solvers, definitely check that one out. It's available on many platforms. They've got a web app, Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, Apple TV. I have an embarrassing number of those devices, uh, but it's available on all of them. Look, if you've got a screen, you'll be able to watch it. You can watch it on the go, like on your iPad or whatever, or you can watch it on home, at home on the big screen. Curiosity Stream is also adding exciting titles all the time as well, which is fantastic. There's always new stuff on there. Go to curiositystream.com forward slash criminalist for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for you guys, you can use the promo code criminalist. You'll get 25% off. Which makes it just fourteen ninety nine a year. That de definitely makes it cheaper than whatever the the monthly price I pay for the other unnamed streaming services. It's an insanely good deal. So click the link below. Go to curiositystream.com slash criminalist and you'll save twenty five percent right now, which makes it fourteen ninety nine for the whole year. What's that? It's a little over a dollar a month or something like that. Maths is not my strong suit, but it is not expensive and it's filled with awesome content. Look, check it out. Check out Crime Scene Solvers. And uh, now back to today's video. A broken bone. On the morning of the 4th of October 1940, a worker from the National Socialist People Welfare Organization showed up at the house of Gertrude Ditter, a 20 year old mother of two. The social worker found her lifeless body in the kitchen of her apartment. Her hyoid bone was broken, a sign of strangulation. No idea what a hyoid bone is, but I'm going to assume it's in the neck. Moreover, her left carotid artery had been sliced through with a knife and she had bled to death. Her two young children were alive, crying for their mum in a nearby room. Holy sh. The Orpo were first on the scene, initially treating the death as suicide, but they quickly realized this was not the case and called the Crippo. Yeah, I mean, good. Some decent police work there. It's like, no, people don't strangle themselves to death to the extent of breaking a bone and then slice their neck open. Autoerotic asphyxiation. Yep. That's not how people, that's not a suicide. Even I read that and it'd be like, okay, it's not a suicide. Detectives immediately suspected Gertrude's husband, Arthur, and took him in for questioning. Fair enough. It is, you know, it's always the husband's. But Mr. Ditter was serving in the military at the time, stationed in nearby Potsdam, and was able to provide an alibi. Except when he's not f***ing there. <laughs> what neither the detectives nor Mr. Ditter could suspect is that Gertrude had struck up a friendship with a railway worker at the Rummelsburg station only a few days earlier. And yes, it was that railway worker. Gertrude had invited a new friend to visit her flat. The railway man came knocking on the evening of the 3rd of October. After some small talk, he decided it was time for action. First, he squeezed her neck hard enough to fracture that hyoid bone. Then, to ensure she was dead, he stabbed her in the neck. The murderer fled the flat, leaving behind no murder weapon, no fingerprints, and two witnesses too young to talk. The cripo was thoroughly stumped, and the case turned cold. Cripo, are you just incompetent? Like, we were thoroughly stumped. I don't know. How about you go to the f***ing railway station? How about you talk to some railway workers? How about you ask the children? How about a magic trick? I know they're all traumatized and shit, but just be like, was he old or was he young? 
What color was his hair? You know, like child questions. My child's two years old. She has a vague understanding of colors. Nah, she'd never be able to help with this. <laughs> nah, nah, I over How old are the kids? We don't know. But Crippo, you could do a better job. You could at least, I don't know, try. A length of pipe. One month passed by. At 11 p.m. on the 4th of November, 30-year-old Elizabeth Bendorf had just finished her shift selling tickets at the Friedrichshagen station uh, of the S-Bahn. She was about to board a third-class carriage to return home when a friendly co-worker invited her to travel in second class with him instead. Why is it with this? You can't just, like, invite people to your section, otherwise everyone would just buy third-class tickets. If you were traveling as a group, you'd just be like, okay, well, we can buy two second-class tickets, or one of us can buy a first-class ticket, one of us can be a third-class ticket, and we can invite the third-class person to sit with us in first class. That makes no sense. He was cheating. <laughs> just, can you imagine doing that on a plane? Just go up to someone who's sitting in first class and be like, mind if I sit with you? They'll be like, uh, it doesn't work like that, does it, mate? <laughs> At that time of night, the second-class carriages were almost surely empty, more space to sprawl and relax, and less of a chance to run into witnesses. The two sat across the street from each other for a while, engaging in small talk. When the train pulled away from a station, the railway man produced a thick length of lead pipe and hit Elizabeth on the head. But Elizabeth was still conscious. She fought back and screamed as loud as she could. The attacker raised and lowered the weapon again and again until she finally slumped onto the carriage floor. He then turned away from her, opened the door, breathing in fast-moving cold air. He savored the night, thrilled to recreate the pleasure of throwing a woman's body from a moving train. When he turned again towards Elizabeth, he was surprised to find her still alive. Stunned by the blows, Ms. Bendorf was trying to crawl away from her tormentor. The railway man approached her, slowly, one step at a time. Once more, he struck her on the head with a lead pipe. Miraculously, Elizabeth survived also this last blow. Powerless, she could only watch as the assailant dragged her by the feet, toward the open train door. After a further streak of violent blows, the attacker lifted Elizabeth from the ground and flung her against the wall of darkness. He then wiped his weapon, the pipe against his uniform, to remove any fingerprints and hid it in the compartment. Just like any other commuter, the railway man clocked off from his labor of violence and rode the S-Bahn home. As he entered his flat, he made sure not to make too much noise. He didn't want to wake up his wife and two children. The morning after Elizabeth Bendorf was found on the embankment of the S-Bahn line, she was in dark condition, but still alive. This guy is, I mean, it's just like how, if, she, if, the, if he doesn't get, I know he doesn't get caught because we're not even halfway through today's episode, but it's like, police, you're already like showing a lot of incompetence. And if they can't get him with two failed murders in the same location, in the same way, I'm going to be very disappointed. I get the feeling I'm going to be very disappointed. After eight days in hospital, she was finally well enough to speak to the cripple. She did not remember most of the attack and was not sure about the physical features of the attacker. But one last thing was for sure. The man wore the uniform of a railway worker. Investigators picked up the file again of the previous victim who had survived, Gerda Cargill. Her testimony had been dismissed by the Yorpo, but now it was clear that the woman on the S-Bahn were being targeted by a malicious predator. The Cripo detectives searched the crime scene and found the lead pipe in and behind the cushions of a second-class carriage. The pipe turned out to be a piece of telephone cable 2 centimeters thick and 50 centimeters long encased in lead. The police spoke to the telephone company and found that the cable had been initially laid near the Rummelsburg station of the S-Bahn. So, an improvised weapon easily accessible to a railway employee. A profile of the murderer was starting to emerge. <laughs> well done. <laughs> what, let me, let me guess. Let me guess, he's a railway employee, police. You being sarcastic, soldier? Good job. A double murder. Another month went by. Really? <laughs> we think there's no interviewing people who work at the railway station. There's no looking into that just a little bit more. There's no like, maybe we should have some undercover police on the S-Bahn at night. Nothing. Just a month goes by. And I get the feeling, given by the, uh, the title of this entry, there's going to be a double murder. So kind of at this point, you're like, is it, the, is it the murderer's fault or is it the police's fault? I mean, obviously it's the murderer's fault, but come on, police. On the night of the 4th of December, 26-year-old nurse Elfrida Frank was sitting in an empty second-class compartment. The S-Bahn had just left Karlshorst Station when an iron rod slammed into her skull. The railway man was pleased with himself. He had killed his victim with a single clean blow. He then proceeded to enact his favorite ritual. He dragged Frank by her feet next to the carriage door, pushed it open, and threw the nurse off the moving train. Half an hour later, the attacker disembarked at Karlhorst Station. His bloodlust was not yet sated. He felt a rush of excitement as he spotted a teenage girl walking alone. She was 19-year-old Ermgard Fresser. The man 
crushed her skull with three swift blows, ripped her clothes, and sexually assaulted her. When passerbys found her later that night, she was still breathing. Imgard was rushed to the hospital, but she died without regaining consciousness. In the meantime, Nurse Frank's body had been found and the crypt had been called in. Dr. Vyman and Inspector Zack huddled by her body in a scene that we've already described at the start of the story. Vyman was unsure that this case was connected to the other two women found by the S Barn track. Yeah, I mean, sure you'd be unsure. You're like, I'm not 100% sure. I'd say like 99%, like in the last couple of months, two women have been assaulted and thrown off a train. And then another woman is assaulted and thrown off a train. And Vyman's like, well, we're not sure if they're connected. <laughs> really, Vyman? Come on, get your shit together. <laughs> I'm not 100% certain that it was by a railway worker. <laughs> Come on! Zack, on the other hand, was convinced that the attacks were all related. That's because Zack obviously has a big brain. I mean, he's got a regular sized brain. Because anyone should be like, yeah, they're probably connected. But it just seems that Dr. Vyman barely has a functioning brain at all. What neither could suspect at the time, though, is that these three cases were related to Mrs. Dritter slain in her flat or the string of sexual assaults in the allotment area. Yeah, that's totally fair. I don't think anyone would expect those to be connected. But also, a couple of murders, a couple of attempted murders, that's enough. That guy's good, you know, that's enough to actually track someone down and send them to prison forever. What Zach and his Crippo colleagues knew for sure, though, is that their superiors were clamoring hard for a solution to the mystery. They had to find a culprit, preferably a foreign worker or an undesirable. Surely no Aryan citizen could commit such heinous crimes. Obviously not. How could an Aryan commit a crime? Like genocide, holy shit. The Crippo could have used some cooperation from the press or the radio, for example, by issuing a public warning to all women in Berlin not to travel alone on the S Bahn. But Joseph Goebbels' Ministry of Propaganda had already sent directives to hush up the crimes. No details could be revealed to the public, lest Berliners thought that the Nazi regime was unable to maintain law and order. It would take a top detective at the Crippo to tackle this case. A detective on the prowl. On the 5th of December 1940s, Inspector Zack was called by Superior Captain Wilhelm Ludke, head of the Serious Crimes Unit. Ludke would take the lead from then on. Born in 1886, this veteran officer had first joined the police in 1910. After World War I, he had been a member of the German Democratic Party. As such, he was a staunch supporter of the Weimar Republic, trying to maintain law and order as German society descended into chaos. Ludke had no sympathy for those goons in brown shirts and swastika armbands that had been engaging in violent street battles throughout Germany. In fact, as head of the political branch in Frankfurt, he had actively opposed the violent methods of the Nazi Party until they rise to power in March 1933. <laughs> yeah, it's like, ah, uh, you can be like, he's like, I really don't like how these, these Nazis are doing terrible things. We should definitely not stand for that. This is horrible. And then they come to power and become super violent. He's like, I mean, I love it. You two-faced bastards. <laughs> oh, please don't hurt me. In May of 1933, a disciplinary court found him guilty of interfering with Nazi rallies and had him transferred to the Serious Crimes Unit in Berlin. Wait, that sounds like a promotion. Serious crimes? Surely that's like the top of where a detective wants to go to. Even after Hitler's election as Chancellor, Ludke had resisted joining the party. Eventually, he was forced to become a member in 1940. On that very 5th of December, Captain Ludke and Dr. Weimann met to consider all the elements of the recent murders and violent attacks. <laughs> Dr. Weimann's like, I have no idea what's going on. I think the murderer was a Jew. <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> no, I have no idea if Weimann was anti-Semitic. I'm kind of just... I don't know, he just seems a bit dim, doesn't he? The captain reviewed again the reports of the non-lethal aggression taking place in the allotment area and drew some conclusions. First, some of the victims had reported that the assailant was wearing a railway uniform. Second, Gertrude Ditter's house, where she had been found dead, was in the same area. Third, the attacker on the S-Bahn also wore a railway worker uniform and had used an improvised weapon procured next to the train tracks. Fourth, when the attacks on the train had started, no more offences had report been reported in the allotment area. Wow, this guy's actually a competent policeman. Look at that chain of logic that he's doing kind of surprised and impressed. His final assumption was that all three crimes were connected and the perpetrator was the same. A life within a life. Citizens of Berlin were now preparing for their second Christmas since the start of the war. Some days before the holiday, another body was found by the S-Bahn tracks. They belonged to 30-year-old Elizabeth Bowen Jenner. The police found a medical note in her pockets diagnosing her with depression and ruled the death as a suicide. But Dr. Vyman's examination confirmed that she had been beaten with a blunt object. The Espan murderer 
had claimed his fourth victim. And some, uh, look, some competent work from Dr. Vyman there for the first time. And he would kill again in rapid succession. On the 20th, how is this guy not caught? He's operating in a small area while all the men are at war. There seems to be an incompetent detective finally on the case. And he's wearing his work uniform. <laughs> What is going on? On the 29th of December, it was the turn of 40-year-old Gertrude Siebert. When rescuers found her, she was still breathing but died shortly after reaching the hospital. On the 4th of January 1941, another victim was rushed to hospital. She had been strangled and then thrown off the train. 27-year-old Hedwig Barr grasped onto life for a day before giving up. Sadly, she was pregnant at the time of her death. Based on where she had been found, Lutke was able to determine the compartment in which she had likely been attacked. Wow, that's kind of impressive. His officers rushed to investigate, hoping to find some leads. Unfortunately, it was a Sunday, the day in which all the carriages were thoroughly cleaned by the S-Bahn crews. All evidence had been mopped away. A frustrated Ludke... <laughs> what sort of evidence are they mopping away? So it's been... Either there's like lots... I mean, this is like back in the day, so it's not like we're scraping for DNA and, and all of that kind of shit. I guess they were doing fingerprints back then, maybe? I'm not even sure. Yeah, the guy was wiping the fingerprints off the blunt object earlier, so I guess they did have fingerprint technology. If there was some evidence, I guess they could be looking for hairs, but there's no DNA. So what are they cleaning up? Just a giant pool of blood. And no one at the S-Bahn cleaning crew is like, uh, should we tell anyone that? It's like, just clean the blood. Every time my fingers touch brain, I'm super fly TNT. I'm the guns of the Navarone. Just clean it up. Come on. <laughs> it's Nazi Germany. <laughs> People live in fear. Just do your job. Don't raise attention to yourself. A frustrated Ludke resorted to setting up a trap. He instructed female officers to travel on the S-Bahn trains at night, hoping to catch the murderer red-handed. Finally! The plan almost succeeded. One night in early February, an undercover policewoman was approached by a friendly yet creepy railway worker. In a tense moment, she realized he was about to attack. Somehow, also the murderer realized that this was not a helpless victim and backed off at the last moment. The officer, according to Berlin police regulations, was unarmed, but gave chase nonetheless. Oh my god, what? Who is volunteering for this? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What we need to do, you to do, lady police officers, is uh, there's a murderer on the trains. He's almost certainly armed with some sort of heavy metal object. Um, you need to go in there and be bait. And like, okay, do we get to have our guns? No guns. That's against the rules. Can I have some volunteers, please? I volunteer as tribute. <laughs> They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go. <laughs> oh my god, bravery, Jesus. The train was slowing down as it was approaching a station. The sneaky assailant took advantage of the situation, flung open the carriage door, and jumped outside. The spook had vanished in the blacked-out night, and the officer had not been able to clearly see his face in the dimly lit compartment. I remember a mate of mine showed up for school one day, and he was all f***ed up. Like, he had cuts on his face and his body. And he was like, dude, what happened to you? And he's like, oh yeah, I got drunk, and I, I thought it'd be a good idea to jump off the train before I got into the station, you know? Like, he was there, the platform was there, and he's like, yeah, f***ing, I'm just gonna jump for it. And uh, yeah, obviously, he hit the ground, his legs just swept out beneath him, and he rolled along the train platform and got all cut up. And I'm like, <laughs> that wasn't the best idea, was it, mate? <laughs> The scare with the undercover officer apparently did not deter the murderer from striking again. On the night of the 11th of February 1941, 39-year-old Joanna Voigt was waiting for a train at Karlhorst Station. Even though the newspapers were forbidden from publishing stories about the murders, she had heard some rumors about a vicious killer prowling the train lines. This is ridiculous propaganda. It's like, yo, just because you made your society super airy in Goebbels doesn't mean there's not going to be any murders anymore. Yes, it does. Doesn't it? You'll quickly realize that. Or just cover it up, I guess. Christ. She was alone and scared in the dark. Luckily, she spotted an S-Bahn employee and asked him if he could accompany her on the train. Oh my god, please don't tell me that this is the dude. The one she asked for help happens to be the person. She only had to get down to the ne at the next station. Sure, the man answered. He would gladly be her chaperone. How about a free upgrade to second class? Oh no! What are the chances? And also this... But I'm, like, I'm also like, what are the chances? Which makes me think, like... It'd be like, the only way this can happen is if there's not many railway employees. Which would be like, so police, why don't you just start interviewing all the railway employees until you find someone who doesn't have any alibis and is super suspicious and uh, just looks like a bit of a murderer? Because obviously there can't be that many if she just happens to bump into the one dude who is the murderer. As soon as Joanna took a seat, the iron bar struck her on the head over and over again. Before the train had reached the next station, her body had landed on the embankment. Her heart stopped beating. As she struck the ground. Shortly afterwards, another tiny heart. Oh, no. Stop beating inside her. She was three months pregnant. 
Captain Ludke was furious. If only he could publicize the events, he could prevent more women from being mercilessly beaten to death by that scumbag. Eventually, he somehow managed to have a notice published on the Valentine's Day edition of the newspaper Der Westen. The article featured a description of Dranovoit's murder and invited members of the public to provide any valuable information leading to the capture of the S-Bahn murderer. In exchange, they would receive a reward of 13,000 Reichsmarks. That's almost $100,000 in 2022 money. So understandably, the Crip officers were flooded with 15,000 tip-offs. Good lord, that's a lot. That's a giant prize. Far too many to be properly followed up. Finally, the police captain took the most obvious decision. He instructed Inspector Zack and his men to question the railway employees in Berlin. All 5,000 of them. Oh my god, okay. That's a lot of employees, but still. Well, okay, but there's 5,000 of them. Immediately eliminate anyone who doesn't work at night. Let's just say that's two-thirds, because obviously it's going to be... Um, more busy at night. So we're down to, what, roughly 1,700-ish? Is my maths there? Um, and then eliminate all women. And then eliminate all... I, I mean, I don't know what else to eliminate. Now, while I wasn't able to cut everyone I wanted to, I have cut a lot of you. But you can eliminate various things, and whitt- let's say you could easily enough whittle that down to a 1,000 people. This doesn't seem like... This seems like this should happen much earlier. A trail of footprints. As the officers worked their way through the roster of railway workers, the immediate effect was that the attack stopped. Also, yeah. <laughs> it also is like, okay, some they're on to me. They're on to me, so probably stop attacking, which is a good thing, because even if they're not getting caught, at least there's less murders. Clearly, the murderer had been cowed by the intense police activity and was restraining his urges. On one hand, uh, Ludke was pleased. On the other, he feared that the blanket questioning would lead nowhere. He had to lure the killer out in the open if he wanted to catch him. On the 1st of July, 1941, the captain decided to take a gamble. He asked his detectives to spread the rumor that police monitoring was to cease as it appeared futile. Two days later, a group of nine co-workers unboarded the train at Rummelsburg. Unbeknownst to them, someone was watching. One of them, 35-year-old Frieda Koziol, walked away from the station, tentatively finding her way home in the pitch-black night. A voice startled her. It was a man. He introduced himself as a railway employee and offered to walk her home. Frieda must have been annoyed by the attention, since most men were away training or fighting on the Eastern Front. Every male left behind in Berlin felt he had the chance, nay, he had the right to chat up the ladies. Frida shrugged him off and kept walking. The next thing she heard was the sound of her own skull cracking under the swift blur of an iron bar. Frida collapsed on the pavement, and the attacker climbed on top of her, raping her as she gasped her last breaths. Ludka had failed. He had hoped to spring a trap on the perpetrator, catching him red-handed, but he felt responsible for causing yet another murder. The detective had not been beaten yet, though. He and his team found a trail of footprints in the dirt close to Frieda's body. Forensic analysis determined the footprints to belong to a man's pair of shoes, 39 and a half in size. They had likely been left by a pair of special boots with extra thick soles, manufactured at the time only by the Salamander Company in Berlin. The creepo was in luck, as wartime rationing regulations demanded the companies kept a list of customers for this special type of garment. Ludke reviewed the list, crossing out men serving in the Wehrmacht and those who lived too far from the crime scene. He was left with just one name, Ha Hyman. Also, why didn't he do this before, though? Why did you have to wait to find the special garments? Just start. There's another way of, of limiting things down. Anyone who's aware at war, just eliminate them. Anyone who doesn't live nearby, eliminate them. Of course, it could be someone who travels, but at least, you know, you're really increasing your chances. Hyman lived close to the site of the attack. Moreover, he had a criminal record as a sex offender, more precisely as a peeping Tom who liked to spy on couples making love in the open. There is another way to narrow it down. This is all basic police stuff. Anyone who's a criminal already, put them to the top of the list. Don't eliminate everyone else. Don't assume it's the guys who have a criminal record. But if there's a guy who's like a sexual criminal from before and he's and, and you're looking for someone who's committing uh, uh, escalated sexual crimes, maybe that's the guy you want to look at. The creepo took Hyman into custody and confiscated his shoes. They matched the footprints found in the dirt. The suspect was interrogated eight times over three days. It emerged that he had no connections to the S-Bahn except as a passenger. But Luke pressed on until the man confessed. Not to the murder, though. He confessed to having been near the site of the sexual assault, spying as the actual murderer was taking advantage of a dying woman. Only after the killer had left had he realized the woman was dead and he had fled the scene. Lutke believed him, and this was not his man. It had been another failure, but the hound was not far from a breakthrough. A model citizen. 
In July, Zach and his officers resumed their questioning of the S-Bar and crews. The question that finally yielded some results was, have you noticed anything suspicious about any of your co-workers? A railway employee did report something unusual, very unusual indeed. He had spotted one of his colleagues, an assistant signal man, as he quit his post during work hours. He would climb the fence by a railway yard, walk away into the night, and return before anyone could notice. Or so he thought. The cripple had already spoken to this particular signal man. He was well regarded by his superiors and colleagues who considered him to be a serious worker, a devoted husband, and a loving father. Ah, the mask. The mask will fall. Moreover, he was a German born and bred, a staunch follower of National Socialism and a veteran of the Sturm Abteilung, or SA, the infamous brown shirts. Plus, some of the crimes had occurred while he was supposedly at work, so he was cleared of suspicion. But this new piece of information changed everything. Apparently, this guy was able to leave at will and returned to his post undetected. On the 12th of July, 1941, at quarter to seven in the morning, a crippo detective picked up the new suspect at his apartment. His name was Paul Ogozov. Also, I'm slightly concerned. This dude's a signalman, right? And he's just, like, leaving his post? Isn't the point of the signal? on railways to be like yeah yeah this train could go this one stop to stop trains crashing into each other it also feels like leaving that post might be a crime as well and you'd be like well it's not as serious as the other crimes is it and i was like boy it is if two trains crash into each other lutka questioned him about his escapades and ogazov denied leaving his post had he done so his superiors would have surely reprimanded him lutka did not believe him and eventually ogazov admitted that he had been playing truant he claimed that he had been sneaking out to visit a woman with whom he was having an affair while her husband was at the front the cripple spoke to ogazov's lover and she admitted to the tryst. Was this another dead end? It could have been, had not Ludke ordered to confiscate the suspect's uniform. Forensic analysis of the fabric revealed that the tunic and trousers contained traces of blood. The largest quantity was found around the crotch area. <sighs> Confronted with this evidence, Argozov claimed that some of the blood came from a cut to his finger, while the rest belonged to his wife, who had been unwell lately. The interrogators did not buy the story and kept pushing for answers. <sighs> He's been unwell lately. That's how the blood got on my uniform. <laughs> It's like, when was the last time that someone got unwell that blood went everywhere? That's not unwell. That's like badly injured. Eventually, Ogozov cracked under pressure. His first confession related to the assaults perpetrated in the allotment area. Crippo detectives took him to the district and asked him to retrace the landmarks of his unglorified career as a sex pest. On the occasion, they brought along two of the women who had suffered his early attacks. One of them recognized him instantly. On the way back to police headquarters, Argozov asked to speak to the lead investigator. He wanted to tell his story to a high-ranking official, probably hoping that someone like Ludke could help him on the back of his shining Nazi credentials. Who was Paul Ogazov? This would be the right time to introduce the backstory of our chief suspect. He was born in September 1912 in the village of Mantov in East Prussia. At birth, he was registered as Paul Saga after his mother's surname. His father was recorded as unknown. At the age of 12, he changed his name when he was adopted by the Ogazov family and moved to the Haverland district near Berlin. Not much is known about his early years, except that they were, well, pretty normal. It's a recurring theme of the show that serial killers suffered horrific abuse as children and that they displayed the early signs of psychology or antisocial tendencies such as harming animals, setting property on fire, or bedwetting. Oh yeah, I totally forgot about bedwetting. That did come up as a thing, which is weird. Is that a common thing though? Like, I get, of course, arson, like setting property on fire. That's a big one. Harming animals, probably even bigger. Didn't realize bedwetting. Is that actually one? Three trades shared by 95% of all serial killers. Bedwetting, pyromania, animal cruelty. But this was not the case for Paul. As a teenager, he worked as a laborer in the farm of his adoptive father and then took a job at a steelworks blast furnace. At the age of 19, in 1931, Paul joined the Nazi party. In the following year, he enlisted in the SA, the brown shirts rising to the equivalent rank of sergeant. On the 30th of June, 1934, the SA were violently purged by members of the SS under Hitler's instructions. The episode, known as the Night of the Long Knives, led to a massive downsizing of the paramilitary group. Ogazov left the organization and took on a more mundane occupation with the maintenance crews of the National Rail Company. After a series of promotions, he got a job as an assistant signalman in the Rummelsburg Freight Yard. In 1937, he married saleswoman Gertrude Ziegelman. The two had two children together, a boy and a girl. The family moved to the Carlos district of Berlin, where they led an apparently quiet life. Paul would often be seen at home playing with his kids, watering his vegetable guards, nor picking cherries from a tree in the back garden. But behind this ideal, darkness 
was brewing. It later emerged that Argazov was frequently physically abusive to his wife and would seek the attention of other women, especially lonely passengers who did not mind being chatted up by a friendly railway man in his uniform. A row of skulls. By the time Argozov was driven back to the Kripo offices, Lutka was ready to meet him. High-ranking party members had exhausted their patience, and they demanded the, the captain obtain a confession. He would get it in the most morbid way. When Argozov was marched into the interrogation room, Lutka and the coroner, Dr. Weiman, had laid out a macabre display. The skulls of the five victims had been carefully cleaned and neatly lined up in a row upon the interrogation table. Confronted by the empty stare of five dead women, Argozov finally confessed. He was the S-Bahn murderer. Why are you doing this? They, they cleaned the skulls and had these skulls there? Isn't there a point where you've taken all your notes and you're like, okay, and now we'll allow the family to bury the victims or whatever, or, you know, cremate them or do whatever is in accordance with their customs. Is that no, no, no. We kept the heads and cleaned them. <laughs> it's f***ed up. The killer implored Ludke for help, and the captain assured him that he would do what he could, provided that Ogazov gave a full confession. Ogazov agreed. He retold his crimes in fine detail, but he got something wrong on purpose. He said his weapon had been a knife in all his murders. In Ogazov's intention, planting a wrong detail was a clever tactic to later recant his confession, but the skulls spoke for themselves. Ludke pointed to the injuries, which clearly hinted at the use of a blunt object. Eventually, the murderer admitted that he had bludgeoned the de to death the majority of his victims. But he was not done with trying to weasel out of a criminal sentence. How are you possibly going to weasel out of this, my dude? You've just confessed. And there's lots of evidence against you, and people recognized you. Ogozov blamed his deviant acts on gonorrhea. He had caught it three times in Berlin in 1934, in Poland in 1940, and also in Paris in 1940. He had been incompletely treated by a Jewish doctor, which had compromised his state of mind. It was not his fault, after all, so he demanded to be interned in a psychiatric hospital. Of course, Ludke did not buy a single gram of that a wagon load of bullshit. On the 22nd of July 1941, Ogozov went on trial, was charged with the murder of eight women, and the attempted murder of further six. On that same day, the court found he was fully sane and convicted him on all counts. The sentence was carried out the following day, death by means of guillotine. Whoa. Holy shit, I did not expect And now it's dismembered appendices. <laughs> that shit got wrapped up super quick. I didn't realize that... I mean, I still thought, like, I guess Nazi, it's Nazi Germany, so, you know, of course, shit got crazy. But did people really get executed so quickly in the past? We did one the other day, and it was, like, immediately, like, he was taken out back and shot, and it's like, holy shit. I didn't really realize that happened in the in Europe in the 20th century, even in some crazy, like, outside of war crimes. That's pretty intense. There's no appeals <laughs> for a death sentence. It's just like, I said it's you to death. Bailiff, get your gun ready. Dismembered of Endices. One. Apparently, the Nazi judiciary cared much about the proper maintenance of their execution devices. As per regulation, an invoice for the wear and tear of the guillotine blade was sent to the relatives of the condemned prisoner. In this case, Mrs. Gertrude Ogazov. <laughs> Holy shit, really? Two. I was interested in finding out more about Kripo Captain Wilhelm Ludke, who certainly makes for an interesting character. A 33-page dossier about him can be found on the CIA Freedom of Information Act search engine. What? Most of his contents of poorly rendered documents are in German, which I hope to decipher in the near future. Why does the CIA have a 33-page dossier on this guy? From the few pages in English, I found out that in November 1949 he had submitted a request for his denazification to the office of the U.S. High Commissioner for Germany. In other words, he wanted to be acknowledged as a non-Nazi. And this quote was, quote, denied on the grounds that you are considered to have more than nominal participation in the activities of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. As a result, he could not resume his office in the police. Lutke became a private investigator working for coffee import-export firms in Hamburg and Berlin. In this capacity, he helped the customs office in cracking down on the smuggling of coffee from beyond the Iron Curtain. That seems like a bit of a fool, doesn't it? What was he before? He was investigating murders as part of this, like, super serious crime unit. And now it's like, yeah, I, uh, I look for illegal coffee smuggling, which I didn't realize was even a, a crime that could exist. <laughs> In July of 1951, the CIA considered him a potential agent in West Germany, but the assessment found that, quote, he is well grounded in all phases of police investigative work, but lacks the ingenuity and imagination required of an independent intelligence contractor. Harsh. 
A further document dated 15th of December 1951 includes a note stating, Denazified, no punishments. But there are no records that he rejoined the police around that time. Well, he was 60. Yeah, I was going to say he's pretty old by this time. Well, he was 65 by this time, so he probably enjoyed his retirement while sipping on a delicious brew of contraband socialist coffee. Yes! This has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, uh, please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching this on YouTube, hello, like, subscribe. Also, if you'd like another episode, I got one here to recommend. It's another European-based murder story. Check out Death in the Vatican. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to link to it on the screen now. And I'll see you next time. Now, just before you leave today's video, let me tell you about another channel that I run called Decoding the Unknown. It's a show where I take a deep dive in some of the world's biggest mysteries, from what happened to the Roanoke colonist to the regular guy who found a listening device in one of his power strips. It's always a bit of a wild ride. You can find a link to Decoding the Unknown below, or just search Decoding the Unknown in YouTube and you will find it.